Awesome. All right. Well, welcome everybody to uh, the next Eco Living Kitchen workshop. Uh, as you know, we record these workshops so that we can later post them on YouTube and just share them with more people who aren't maybe able to attend at this time. So we'll be doing that today as well. Um, I think many of you probably know us, but we're going to start off with a quick overview and then an introduction, and then we're going to hand it right over to our guest speaker of the day, Terry from REAPS. So today we're going to go through uh, just a quick overview of who we are and where we come from before starting right into Terry's presentation. And then we're going to go probably do a quick quiz game, but Terry will probably cover most of that stuff as well. So it'll be very brief. <laughs> And then we're going to have a discussion about composting in Prince George and some of the things that you as composters or people who would like to compost think can be changed about our current system or lack thereof. Next slide, please, Anne. Sorry, I, I should tell you instead of just expecting you to read my mind. <laughs> All right, so before we get started on our workshop here, I'd like to acknowledge that we're located on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Clay Lutene, and we're honored to live, work, and play on these lands. If you are located on a different Indigenous territory, as so many of us are, please feel free to drop that territorial acknowledgement in the chat. So we are Eco Living Kitchen. Uh, we are a group of youth who are doing a workshop series and different information sharing on social media to sort of raise awareness about sustainability and waste management within the kitchen uh, in the Prince George area. So that's our main sort of goal for these workshops. My name is Helga. I use all pronouns. Uh, feel free to switch them up or just call me by one. And yeah, I'm a forestry student and conservation student at UNBC with a minor in soil science. And this kind of stuff is just my passion. I apologize for my glasses. I do have eyeballs, but please help me. I think we'll go with Anne next because she's on my screen. Hello, everyone. My name is Anne. Um, my pronouns are she and her. And I'm also a UNBC student. And I joined this initiative because I wanted to meet awesome people like Helga, Shauna, and Hannah and try to find solutions to um, environmental issues in Prince George and beyond. So, and next, let's go to Shauna. Yeah, so hi, everyone. I'm Shauna. I use pronouns she and her. Um, same as the others. I'm also a student at UMBC. I'm doing my undergrad in environmental studies with a minor in political science. I'm originally from Calgary, so I really joined this initiative similar to Anne to really get to know people in the community who are really interested in the environment, taking action, um, and really just building a better community around environmental and climate action. So yeah, really happy to be here today and thank you all for joining. And I'll pass that over to Hannah. Everyone, I'm Hannah. I am also at UMBC, an environmental and sustainability studies degree. Um, I'm also from Calgary, so this place is new to me as well. And I really enjoy being able to take the things that I'm learning in school and apply them directly into the community that I live in and kind of build up that community and the kind of environmental issues that we need to address both on a local scale and beyond. So I'm really excited that we're all here today for that. Awesome. And Terry, I'll let you introduce yourself in your presentation. <laughs> um, so the workshop structure, I just have sort of three key words here that we like to keep in mind. This workshop is inclusive, collaborative, and kind. Uh, none of us are experts in this, except perhaps for Terry. <laughs> but we're all learning from each other. And really, we love to hear about your knowledge and create a space where we can ask questions about what we don't know and share what we do know so that, that we all grow together as a community. Um, take a moment to reflect where you are, who you are, and why you've come to this workshop. We've got quite a few people in today, so we won't ask you guys for um, introductions, but we like to get to know a little bit more about you as we go. And with that, we're going to hand it over to Terry. Okay, I'm just going to share my screen.
Well, thank you very much. Um, yes, I'd like to acknowledge that we're on the traditional territory of the Clayton Tene. Um, my name is Terry McClymont. I'm the executive director for REAPS, Recycling Environmental Action Planning Society. And I've been composting for, goodness, maybe over 40 years. Um, and with REAPS for about 25 years. Um, and so what I'm going to encourage you guys um, to take away message is basically everybody has different material in the home that you're able to compost. So we're going to put on our chef hats and we're going to explore what backyard composting is. It's a form of recycling and it's recycling naturally. So what is compost? Compost is the natural process of decay of any organic materials into a valuable soil like humus material called compost. It's basically fertilizer. It's not soil. It's fertilizer for our plants, our gardens, our lawns, and our uh, potted plants as well. So things that we can compost are like grass clippings, food waste, and leaves. There's a lot more um, items around the home that we can compost, and then I'll touch on a little bit of that. So what do we need to make compost? Well, food, water, and oxygen are the essentials for the decomposers. Think about your composter as a living, breathing system. And these are the essentials for life. Um, you can have a container, but it's not necessary. If you have a large property, you may just have a pile in the backyard. So when we're looking at food waste, we break it down into browns and greens. And browns are high carbon materials such as leaves, straw, paper, sawdust, animal bedding, mixed with manure. It provides energy for all your decomposers and your composter. So it's a good idea when you're starting to compost is to collect these items. So in the fall, I save a lot of fall leaves in um, plastic bags, or you might have a garbage can that you can collect them in. If you have rodents as pets, like many of us do, you can use any herbivore bedding. So um, gerbils, hamsters, rabbits, guinea pigs, that sort of thing. You have a, a endless supply of compost material that's high in carbon. The next item would be greens. Greens are high in nitrogen and they're materials such as our vegetable waste, coffee grinds, grass clippings, manure, cow, horse, poultry, or hog. And greens are essential for the decomposers because it provides growth and reproduction. And so when you look at your browns and greens, you try to have a balance of carbon to nitrogen ratio. And when you're adding your green materials, always think about your hand is your measuring cup. So when you're adding your layers to your compost, no larger than your hand each layer. So you may have a, a layer of greens and then a layer of browns. And with your food waste, you're always bearing your food waste in your compost or covering it up with a non-food source. And this ensures that one, odor doesn't escape, two, it's not an attractant for animals or pests. Things that we need to avoid um, putting into our composter because it causes problems during or after composting are meats, oils, and dairy products. Those are an attractant for our wildlife, so keep those out. It also covers our materials um, with a film that makes composting anaerobically without oxygen. You're going to avoid pet feces from cats or dogs. You're going to avoid diseased or infected plants. And you're going to avoid putting any hard to kill seeds like bindweed or crack, quack grass into your um, composter because it could just perpetuate. Most backyard composters don't get high enough heats for a long enough period of time to ensure that these products are dealt with um, efficiently. Um, the landfill at Foothills and Aust um, Austin Road, they receive high temperatures about 70 degrees for consistently over a week period of time, which will kill a lot of these things. But the backyard composter fluctuates frequently. So you don't achieve these high temperatures long enough to deal with these problem items. So it's best to avoid. So we talked about food. So now water. Water aids in rapid decomposition. It's needed for all the natural decomposers in our um, composter. So you need to make sure it's moist like a wrung out washcloth or a wrung out sponge. If it's too dry, add more water and turn your pile. If it's too wet, add more browns, which will help to um, soak up the moisture. Aeration, getting the oxygen in there. As I mentioned, your composter is a living, breathing system, food, water, and then oxygen. There's many ways to turn your compost pile. Um, you can use a pitchfork, but my favorite thing is the composting turner, which is on your far right. 
all you do is you insert that down, pull it up, the flanges lift everything up. So you're going from the bottom to the middle of the pile. And you think about your composter as a house, all your insulations around the outside, all the heats in the middle. So that's where you're turning your composter. More frequently when you turn your composter, the quicker the decomposition and the more surface area you're creating. Um, for those bacteria. So you want to get everything from the outside where the insulation is to the middle where the heat is. So turning your composter at least three times a week uh, achieves this goal. So if you want to make compost the fast way, turning your pile every two to three days, as I mentioned, moving the outer material to the center of the pile, ensuring it's moist like a wrung out sponge, the first few weeks, the temperatures will reach about 60 degrees. After that, you're going to see less heat. And that's because um, your composter is starting to be maintained. Um, your organisms that do the most amount of work is what you're trying to achieve, which are the thermophiles. So as your composter starts to heat up, you're going to see the worms leave and you're going to see the beetles and centipedes come in because they're more hot loving bacteria. When it's finished, you're not gonna recognize any of the material. It's gonna look like humus. So it's gonna be dark, earthy, brown, crumbly, loose. It's gonna smell really nice. Um, it's gonna contain nothing readily um, distinguishable. So you don't recognize the banana peel, you don't recognize the broccoli stem. Um, and it's gonna shrink about a third of the size from when you filled it up. But the best time to compost is actually the winter time because there's no turning, no watering. And you don't really have to worry about covering up your food waste and adding a balance of browns and greens. Just get out there and fill up your composter. Come April, you're going to notice your composter drops. And that's when you have to start paying attention because the bears are waking up and cover up your compost with a, a non-food source. Sorry, phone's ringing. Um, so where are you going to put your pile? Well, you want to ensure that your pile is taking advantage of the ambient temperatures outside. So placing it in a sunny area on top of soil or on top of grass, don't place it on the cement or your um, organisms aren't going to be able to come into your composter. You're going to avoid any areas that may interfere with your lawn or garden activities or natural pathways of wild animals. You need to have adequate workspace around your pile to turn it, to harvest it. And also if there's an area that you have for your storage of your brown materials and make sure that you have water that's accessible with a garden hose reach here. I should also say that I do home visits for free. So if you have um, a composting issue or problem or you just need me to come and see what's going on, um, we can always arrange that as well. So there's many different types of containers. So you can make your own container. Um, you can make them out of wood, breeze blocks, pallets, um, chicken wire. Ideally, you want a meter by a meter by a meter. Um, gives you the, the, the optimum surface area for the organisms to work. Anything bigger than a meter, you're finding out that it's too difficult to turn and it becomes anaerobic in the middle without oxygen. And it just, it just becomes just unmanageable. Manufactured bins are like the earth machine, the soil saver, there's tumblers. Um, so there's the preference is totally up to you. There's pluses and minus to each um, composter, whether it's manufactured or homemade. There's also some issues that happen around composting and the most common ones are rot and odor. It just means that um, there's anaerobic conditions. So you need to get in there and you need to turn it more frequently um, to prevent excess moisture and compaction. So by turning the pile, you're creating um, more surface area. So things start to break down. You're creating more oxygen in there. And if it's really wet, just add some more brown. So you, if you don't have fall leaves, you can use shredded paper, you can use box board, you can use, which is um, like our cereal boxes are called box board. You can use lint from the dryer, um, and if you notice that there's an ammonia smell, that just means you're adding too many greens. It could be fresh grass clippings. So you need to uh, balance it out with some more carbon material. If you notice that your piles are not um, heating up fast enough, it could be a reflection of the weather. Um, it could be too dry, maybe needs more aeration. Also, you need to uh, think about um, the amount of water. Have I been turning it re regularly? Um, do I need to add some more greens or more manures? And that is an, 
a kickstarter for the composter to get going. So if you notice that your pile is slowing down, you need some more heat in there, throw in some fresh grass clippings or fresh manure. If you find that your pile temperatures are too high, it's not usually a problem, especially here in the north. Um, it just means that you might have insufficient ventilation. So if you find that you can't turn your composter very well, and you're not getting the air in there, you can get a PVC pipe and drill a whole bunch of holes and put it down the middle of your composter and let the air flow down through the pipe and then out into your pile. Um, a lot of seniors use that method because they just can't get in there and turn it. But the compost tool that I showed you is so slick and it works so well. You just go up and down five to 10 times and you're done um, turning your pile. So it's very quick. Other problems that I mentioned um, usually are because people have thrown in some fatty food waste. So meats, dairy, cheese, that sort of thing. Um, and that's a big attractant. So you need to make sure that you don't add those things and always cover your food waste with a non-food source. I can't stress that enough. So if you don't have enough brown material, then dig into your existing pile and cover up your kitchen waste. Make sure you turn it regularly. Um, if you find that the bears are constantly coming back and turning over your composter, it means they're habituated to your area and you might just have to stop composting so then you can turn to composting with worms. The other things, if you notice that there's mice or bees or wasps or ants in your composter, it means it's too dry and you haven't been disturbing it enough. If you disturb your composter by turning it, you're not going to have issues with any um, insects, rodents or bears. So why do we want to compost? Well, it cuts down on landfilling pressures um, and it also creates a rich soil supplement for, that we can use to promote so healthy soil. Um, it attracts earthworms, which help to aerate our soil. It stimulates uh, beneficial soil microorganisms, increases the soil water holding capacity and also soil nutrient retention. So it's what we call gardener's gold. It's kind of our secret to establishing healthy lawns and plants. We can use our finished compost as a mulch, um, a surface mulch, top dressing our lawns um, around the drip line of our trees, mixing it in our potting mixes, and also making a fertilizer called a compost tea. What I like to do is just take a, a pillowcase, put some finished compost, stick it in the rain barrel, let it saturate or steep for a few hours, and then you just fill up your watering can and carry on um, watering your plants. Well, that's it. Thank you so much and happy composting. Awesome. Thank you so much, Terry. So if you don't mind, we'd love to open it up um, to questions from our participants. I think probably the ELK team also has questions we could ask, but uh, first we'll go to our attendees. So if you have any questions for Terry, feel free to speak them out loud or drop them in the chat and we'll go on to those. Usually somebody has one question. Oh, here we've got, we've got one in the chat from Leanne Richard. Do outdoor she composters need worms? Um, the worms will come and go. So usually you see earthworms in there or night crawlers or dew worms, um, whatever the species in your area. And as your composter heats up, the worms will leave because it gets too hot. All right, and then we have another one from Jody. Once um, you got ants in your composters, soak the heck out of it. So as soon as you soak the heck and start turning it, um, all those critters are going to say, hey, this is not conducive for our home, so they leave. You can also set a, a borax trap, um, half and half, like one cup borax, one cup icing sugar, and then uh, put it in a container and then the ants will take it back to their nest. Um, that works, as, works well, as, but it takes a longer time.
You're welcome. So I have a question for you, Terry. Um, and this is because my dad recently told me that he's taking a, a horticultural course online. And he was telling me that the amount of brown, your carbon to nitrogen ratio, they're now recommending that your brown content be far higher than your green content. For you, what kind of ratio do you usually use in your composter? Um, it's well, 30 to one is what they recommend. 30 parts carbon to one part nitrogen, right? Um, the only thing that has that um, specific ratio is peanut husks. And we don't have a lot of peanut shells around here. Um, when I lived in Leamington, there was a peanut farm. So what I recommend for people um, to do is basically if you have a bucket of kitchen waste, then add a bucket of browns. I find that that ratio works very well for us at the compost garden as we're feeding our 14 composters. The real trick is to make sure it's moist like a rang out sponge and turn it frequently. The more you're turning it, the higher the temperatures stay. And then that brings in the thermophiles that give you the most de um, quickest decomposition in the shortest period of time. And I'm only an email or a call away. So it's just, I'll put it in my contact information in the chat box. Um, and, and if you need a home visit or you have further questions, feel free to email or call us. Um, and also check out our website. It has composting information as well. And we do sell the compost turners and we do sell the earth machine composters for the regional district. Um, those composters are $50, which is at cost, and their turners are 24 at cost. Well, I prefer square composters, so I love the soil saver. Um, it's square, and when I'm choosing a composter, I always ensure that it's about my hip height so when I, oh, that's a good point. So when I'm harvesting my composter, it's easy for me to bend down. Those silly little doors at the bottom are useless. I never use them because remember all the insulations around the outside, all the finished stuff's in the middle. So what I do is I have a wheelbarrow with a screen on top and the screen we just make out of two by fours with um, quarter inch mesh around it. I shovel everything out of my composter from the top unless you have space, which you can knock over your composter and then shovel much more easy. Um, so everything goes on top of the screen. I use a trowel, I go back and forth. Everything that's finished falls into my um, wheelbarrow. And then I take my wheelbarrow and use my finished compost wherever I need to use it. And then everything that was on a screen, I put aside until my composter is completely harvested and then add it back to my compost to finish um, decomposing. And I have instructions on how to build various types of composters or to build a compost screen. So you can email me for those as well. The biggest thing to remember, living, breathing system, food, water, oxygen. And use your hand as your rule of thumb. Your layers are no deeper than your hand. Your um, banana peels, broccoli stems, corn on the cob, no bigger than your thumb. So the more surface area you create, the quicker the decomposition. I have a question, Terry. Sure. So if you live indoors, um, how do you vermicompost? <laughs> Uh, well, you need to get a bucket, like a 36 liter Rubbermaid tote, do all the holes on the top and the bottom, um, and then buy some red wiggler worms. You can start off with a half a pound. Um, Cobb Farms, I just got their contact information this morning, and I'm not sure where I put it, um, sells red wiggler worms. And actually, I was surprised how cheap she sells them. She sells them like for $45 a pound. Um, everywhere else in Vanderhoof, for instance, is $75 a pound. 
and then you fill up the the worm bin the rubbermaid tote with a, a shredded paper that's moist and then you add a cup of sand and then you pull all the bedding back put your food waste in pull the bedding back put your worms on top put the lid on it and leave it alone for a week worms are the best pets they thrive on neglect but they need to be the bedding needs to be moist like a running out sponge as well because they breathe through their skin so you only disturb them once a week and when i mean disturb you get in there you fluff the bedding up make sure the holes in the bottom are not plugged if they're plugged you just stick a pencil up and then you pull the bedding back um, check and see how they're doing with the food and then bury more food in the opposite side and always make sure you don't overload the bin with food and it takes about a month for a new bin to create enough bacteria to aid in digestion. And then it'll start moving much quicker. That's the short version, Anne. Thanks, Jerry. You're welcome. So you can put vegetable scraps and other things in there, right? Same thing you feed a composter, except oh, no okay. yard and garden trim. It's all kitchen waste for the red wigglers. Cool, thanks. You might have noticed I didn't talk about turning composters. Those are my least favorite. Um, basically, you're working with bacteria mostly and flies and fly larvae or maggots, um, which are my least favorite critters. Um, and you need to turn it every day. And it's preferable if you have a bar going through your turning composter so it breaks things up or you have to get in there with your pitchfork and turn it to break things up because with the turning ones, it comes like bread dough, it, form, it just forms a big mat. So I've never had success with those ones. Um, and you can only fill those turning composters a third full or they get too heavy for you to be able to lift and turn. But you're supposed to get compost in two weeks, but that's turning it every day. Do we have any more questions out there from anybody? <laughs> if we don't, we can take our five minute break now. Um, so we'll take a bit of a break, uh, get up, stretch, move around, uh, use the washer if you need to, grab a cup of water, um, and then we'll be back in five minutes for our kind of next, next part of the workshop. Oh, yeah, we'll come back at 335. A big thank you for Terry, to Terry for joining us. That was awesome. Well, it's cool in Prince George today, Leanne. I can sympathize, though. I certainly am not a thermophile. I might be an extremophile, but certainly not a thermophile. <laughs> Okay, well, welcome back from the break, everyone. So 
I think that uh, Terry kind of went over all of this stuff, but I think we'll just do it really quickly again. So we have a whole bunch of things here, and most of them, excluding the plastic bag, although it might be one of these new um, decomposable plastic bags, do decompose, but we don't necessarily want to put them in our composter. So like Terry mentioned, those things that are really fatty or oily or are highly likely likely to attract wildlife. So example, for example, our meat and our pie wouldn't necessarily be the best thing to put in our composter. Um, in response to that, I often think, why are you putting pie or meat in your composter? You should have eaten all of that before you threw it away. Um, so as we know, we should always start with reducing the waste that comes out of our kitchen before we have to put it in the composter. Of course, there will still be some waste. And we know that we can use our green leaves for our nitrogen content. We can use our paper products for our carbon content and our cardboard that we have there. That's also usable. Um, is there anything here? We're gonna assume our plastic bag is not a plastic bag, but one of the biodegradable ones that are now coming out. Is there anything here, Terry, that is particularly challenging to compost? I'm looking at the onion because I've heard stories that when you first start composting, there are certain materials that you shouldn't put in your composter. And one of those things is onions. <laughs> Um, great question. Um, onions are fine for the backyard composter. Worms do not, like the red wigglers when you're vermicomposting, don't like garlic, onions, and potato skins. So I avoid those in the worm compost bin, but in the backyard compost, I throw onions in. Another one um, people talk about is potato skins. Um, I find from a family of four that doesn't interfere with the composting process. And the other one is rhubarb leaves is another big one that I always heard wise tales about. Wives tales? Yeah. <laughs> um, and I don't have a problem with the rhubarb leaves either. The big thing is make sure everything's small, right? So two inches um, is the best um, size for all items in the composter to break down quickly. Awesome. And Leanne asked me the question I wanted to hear. What is the green woman doing? So it is not yet legal in Canada, but in Colorado and Washington, I believe, you are now able to decompose yourself after death. Ah, so, Prince George's also has green burial. Really? We do? Yeah, yeah. Oh my goodness. You know, I looked it up just earlier and it's, I looked up, you know, composting the dead Canada. Um, <laughs> and it said <laughs> it was illegal across Canada. No, no. Um, there has just been talk about it in the last year. Um, so there is green burial coming to Prince George. I'll have to find it for you, Helga. Oh my goodness, you, please do. I mean, I, I don't tend to be heading that way anytime soon, but <laughs> when I eventually do, uh, I would love to uh, explore that. <laughs> um, so I think it's just really an interesting way of conserving space because our current burial practices often take up a lot of space and are often really hindering to the natural decomposition process. So that's something for everyone to look into. And there is, I believe Shauna has a link to a news article that sort of goes over some of the green burial process. Uh, but if Terry, you send me that info about PG related green burial, we'll definitely put that on social media. Sure. That's fantastic. I'm so glad you're here. <laughs> That's so exciting. <laughs> so there you go, everybody. We can compost all of these things, most of them, um, safely and away from wildlife. And soon in Prince George, we can compost ourselves as well. And apparently it only costs $2,736. Which I've heard, at least I, I haven't had the experience of having to go through the funeral process with anyone, but I believe that's cheaper than um, the regular process of purchasing a coffin, etc. If I can find the chat, I'll put it in there. Everyone. Anyway, it, it is to some a bit of a um, 
you know, a, an iffy topic. Uh, and I know that not all people agree with that this is the way we should handle the deceased, but at least for myself and a small contingent of others, it certainly uh, it appears to be a sustainable option in the future. And it is interesting when we're talking about composting to think that it extends beyond food waste, but not just to us, but to all living things as well. We all go back that way eventually. So that's our, that's our philosophical contingent for this <laughs> today's ELF workshop. The information is in the chat. Perfect. Thank you so much, Terry. And Will, I think afterwards I can make a little bit of a post on social media to Hannah if you're keen on putting that out there. Neat. All right. Well, that's all I have for this one. So we'll pop right into the discussion and I'll hand it over to Shauna. Thanks, Alga. So uh, for today, we have these three discussion questions. And we've also put together a Google Jamboard for you all to pop onto. So I'll actually share my screen. And if, there we go, awesome. <laughs> Thank you. So yeah, for those of you not familiar with Google Jamboard, it's fairly easy to use. Um, this is what it will look like when you get on there. And, and when you're on here, you'll see a sticky note tab over here on the left side, you can click that, add your note, you can change the color of it if you want, and click save and it'll appear on the screen. So for our first question for discussion today, we want to just start off with, if you compost at home, what works for you? Um, Terry shared a lot of awesome experiences that she's had and her resources, um, but is there anything that you've experienced outside of that that you'd like to share or uh, your personal experience with composting? We'd love to hear your stories so please do pop on the jam board uh, to type yours in or you can add them to the chat or as always you can also speak aloud if you're more comfortable with that i can't seem to get it to put the sticky on the board oh <laughs> interesting um you can also just type text and you can make a text box if that works for you thank you Nope, not working for me either. Hmm. Is it working for anybody else? One of my ELF team members to work for you? Oh, <laughs> we got one. Yep, it's working for me. Sorry, that was just a test run. <laughs> well, if the Jamboard does not work for you, no worries. Again, we can also just use the chat if that's easier for folks or speaking aloud. Um, really, just whatever is easiest for you to participate um, and share your stories. Um, so one that has come through in the chat for this question it, from Margaret is, I can't really compost in my cramped apartment. I bought them for the benefit of letting my stuff breathe in the landfill and bought them, I believe you commented earlier about buying the uh, compost wool bags, even for a landfill. Um, and yeah, it is difficult, I think, to be composting when, either, when you're in an apartment, especially, or even just when you're in a, in a space that doesn't have like either enough space to do it indoors, or you're just like hesitant to start outdoors, especially. Uh, I know in Prince George, there is a fair bit of discussion around the worry of bears. Uh, so you might just be hesitant to start outdoors even if you do have the space um, but of course as terry mentioned there are ways to mitigate that and uh, hopefully not have to face that issue and i know and helga also did put in the chat for those compostable bags some of them are only for industrial facilities um, there's quite a few stories that have come out of these compostable bags actually not really being that compostable it does need a bit more of a process so and here in Prince George, we don't have that industrial facility uh, for composting all of our kitchen waste and everything. So it can be a difficulty. And yeah, good point there from Terry in the landfill then even having those compostable bags, it's not breathing. You're still getting the higher amounts of methane coming from landfill processes uh, just because that, yeah, that landfill 
uh, environment isn't breathing the same way that a composter does. I also love the love the comment here on our jam board. Wing digger, love this word. I know at Elk, a few of us hadn't heard that word before starting to discuss composting. And we had a lot of fun talking about wing, wing diggers <laughs> and joking about those. So hmm. anybody else have experiences uh, with composting at home? Whether it's inside, backyard? My grandmother used to compost everything in her yard. So she she grew a lot of vegetables, especially melons. Um, they would run rampant in the uh, garden. And when I would visit there in the summertime, they were all over the house as melons. <laughs> we were giving them away to neighbors and anybody that came to visit. It's like you carried two melons home. <laughs> That's awesome. I think if I had a friend who was just giving out free melons every time I went over I've been my friends in the lot, city tend to grow zucchini <laughs> like they grow abundantly in the summertime and then they're like come on come over anybody that comes over I'm going to give you a basket of zucchini and then it's like zucchini bread <laughs> and then zucchini grilled zucchini and then people make zoodles now because they're like less calories and noodles so it's like I like pasta but I don't want to be fat so I want to make zoodles <laughs> Great. Yeah, it's also really nice to see the community, I guess, come together around that. Uh, being able to just give food to friends is really nice. Um, and also, maybe not even just friends, but other people in your community, getting to your neighbors even a bit more, uh, giving out your extra food that you're growing. Yeah, it's really awesome. tomatoes were abundant last year. And we've got one here on the screen for um, small compostable bag liners being something that works. They just they dissolve in water and make the clean process for the mini bucket really easy. And Terry here in the chat has also put in a article on uh, biodegradable items in marine environments. If you want to check that out. Yes, a lot of those what they used to use styrofoam peanuts. But now a lot of those peanut things, like if you, they're like they melt away once they get wet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know from ordering items from Lush, they have those ones. Um, and if I remember correctly, they're also technically edible. I believe. Hannah, is that correct? <laughs> is that what those like they snacks are, are sort of one. like sort of <laughs> like popcorn puffs, but they're not. They just call them some like potato or corn puffs and then they have like a cheddar flavor to them. <laughs> they remind me of those styrofoam things. <laughs> yeah, um, they're both made out of corn. I have eaten the lush styrofoam. People. I've eaten one, <laughs> like, but they don't taste like anything, but they're edible. Nothing happened to me. <laughs> <laughs> Live to tell the tale. <laughs> yeah, maybe not the best snack out there, but no, I mean, there's, a, I think it's called Pirate's Booty. There's a snack that's like, it's essentially the same thing. Except like Judy was saying, cheese. Yes, that's it. The Pirate's Booty. Mm -hmm. But it's like the Aldi brand, which is like their generic store brand. Mm -hmm. um, anybody else tips and tricks for composting at home? I've seen people who live in um, like smaller apartments and they have this, it's almost like a tiny trash can in their cabinet and they put all their compost stuff in there or they throw it in the freezer. And then when um, their city, I guess, has weekly like pickups or drop-offs, then they'll take it over there. And then what's, what's her name? Um, Eva Chen, she's like the VP of Instagram. She has a, a cottage or like a second home up in upstate New York. She has one of those composter things, um, but like you kind of spin it. And so I guess when she goes up there on the weekends, like she checks out her compost, but she also has a lot of bears and animals up that way. So there's always like bear prints on it. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you bring up uh, a couple of great solutions there. Freezing, I know is one that I've seen quite a bit of 
freezing your compost. Uh, if you don't have immediate access to a compost that you can stick in your freezer and that it doesn't smell, it's able to sit there in a container. Um, and also I love the comment here in the chat from Margaret, uh, find a friend with the yard perhaps. So if you don't have the space, I think that's another great way to actually bring, build community around composting is if you've got one friend who's got a yard, set up a few composters in their yard and you can all collectively uh, share that together. And also, yeah, here on the Jamboard, collaborating with neighbors to exchange manure or browns in the country. Yeah, and I know even for some folks, uh, if you don't have a compost yourself, but you're looking for some other ways, perhaps to get rid of your kitchen waste or food waste, I suppose, um, some farms will also take that uh, and they'll have it there for their animals. Uh, so that's another kind of option there for collaborating with uh, some neighbors. Yeah, one of the hotels in our area, they do composting and they take it up to a pig's farm, like further outside of the city. Yeah, from Terry in the chat here, visiting a community garden and asking if you can compost. Uh, Terry, do you know of any community gardens in Prince George that offer that or farmers? Um, not yet. Most of the farmers have been taken up with restaurant, picking up restaurant waste. We pick up restaurant to kitchen waste from six businesses in town. Um, so I don't know anybody off offhand. It's a good time to go down to the farmer's market and, and meet your farmers and seeing if uh, they're accepting any of your kitchen waste for their chickens or pigs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's actually super cool to hear that uh, you do actually work with some restaurants in town to kind of have that system in place. That's really exciting. Um, and yeah, really great motivation there to get down to the farmer's market, uh, pick up some good local food, and then also maybe find a way to heal some of your food waste. So pop onto the second question. So if you're on here, you can uh, click this next arrow and that'll bring you to second jam board. Um, and so, yeah, our second question is what bears have you or are you currently facing in trying to compost? Um, so whether that's actually, you're actually composting and you're having difficulty with it actually just breathing properly, or maybe you're hesitant to compost for some reason. Um, yeah, what barriers have you faced in composting? And I've just been taking everyone's stuff from the chat and conversation, putting it onto the Jamboard so we all can sort of see it visually. I think it's really satisfying to see our ideas displayed that way. So sorry, folks, if you can't access the Jamboard, but we're making it happen in some way or another. <laughs> Thanks, Alga. I would say lack of space or lack of family cooperation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, the lack of family cooperation is one that we haven't talked about too much today yet. Yeah, if you're in a household where, uh, well, at least in my case, when I was in Calgary, living with my parents, it's pretty much them who are handling the waste. I didn't do too much with it. Um, so trying to get them on board with composting is one side of it. Or even if you're on your own, perhaps you live with roommates or if you have kids, trying to get them all into the composting spirit on board with composting and not just automatically going to the garbage can can be hard sometimes. And Margaret also brings up uh, one of the topics that we've uh, been discussing a bit in a few of our past workshops as well as um, being in an apartment building that only recycles cardboard even. So if you're in an apartment, you don't have the space to do an actual indoor composting system with worms and you don't have access to some sort of building uh, composting system itself or that outdoor space to do it, it's, it can be a challenge that way. Any other barriers from folks? Or has it just been easy breezy for everybody?
Oh, and that's an awesome note from Terry there in the chat. Reefs does have brochures for people in apartments um, to get motivated to recycle and compost. So that's a great resource if you are in that situation where you have an apartment or a landlord who isn't so keen on composting and hasn't put in the system that you can, there's a resource there for you. And yeah, challenge from Mario here is producing enough waste. As a single person who uses most vegetable trimmings for stock, there's not enough left for a bin. Yeah, and I think on the other end of that as well is if you only have a small composter and you have a larger family, um, actually making too much food waste for your indoor composter um, to actually handle and, and break down. So I know for me, one thing uh, coming from Calgary, so Calgary actually has a citywide uh, composting system. So we have an industrial facility and everything. So actually moving to Prince George and not having that system in place was something uh, that was a shock for me and kind of just a challenge in itself, I suppose, um, was just coming here and being like, okay, wait, I actually have to like learn how to compost on my own now. Uh, and then finding the resources to actually learn how to do that um, in it's dependent where you are located if that changes things having more wild animals here what that looks like um, yeah so even just finding at least for me finding the resources for it was an initial challenge but of course now we know reaps has a bunch of information out there for you if that is a challenge you are facing here mm -hmm. and another comment here for care from Terry, there are countertop electric composters. Um, I have seen a few of those, and I know some of them are quite on the costly side. And that can be a bit of a challenge there as well as the actual cost of a composter, if depending on what you're looking for, or if maybe you're not looking to do the DIY route. Any yeah, I saw the one that um, Eva Chen and Christine, uh, you put on their Instagram and I'm like, oh my gosh, that looks so cool. Like you just put your scraps and stuff into it. And within a couple of hours you have like compost, but then it's like, that's like 300 plus dollars. <laughs> and I'm like, I don't have that. It's just yeah, like it's expensive and, and it takes up space on your counters. If you have any counter space at all. Yeah, I totally get that, that sense of they look super cool. I really, <laughs> it'd be really awesome to have one and just, I'd probably just sit there waiting for it to finish. <laughs> um, just excited, which I might waste some time doing that. But yeah, they look really awesome. But if there was possibly a way to subsidize that cost or get it down a bit would be really awesome. Any other barriers from folks? Is there any sort of uh, resources that you've been looking for that you haven't been able to find for composting? That's a really awesome story there, Terry, in the chat. Has a friend in Edmonton, single apartment, um, had her worm been going for three years after you gave it to her as a gift. That's really, that's a pretty good <laughs> birthday gift, uh, composter. Uh, and then spring, summer on the balcony and then indoors uh, for the winter. That's, that's pretty awesome. Maybe that's what I'm gonna start asking for <laughs> as a gift is composting stuff or kitchen waste reduction tools. Uh, I also think that's like the best thing to have under your bed. Like there's just <laughs> something great about that. I have a compost under your bed. Mm -hmm. Or oh, it's in the closet, you can say, yeah, I don't have any skeletons in my closet, but I do have worms in my closet. Um, that could be an interesting discussion starter. <laughs> Yeah, I think I feel like everyone here is really pro compost because 
like Terry said, the no odor thing, often when people are sort of more afraid of composting, that's like the first thing they bring up is the smell. And then for people who want to compost outside, I've heard a lot of folks be like, oh no, the wild animals, um, which also no one has really raised, but Terry has told us a whole bunch of ways to combat both those things, which has been really nice. And yeah, if it comes up after this workshop as well, um, Terry did put her contact info in the chat. So please do reach out if you have questions or you can also reach out to us if you're looking for other resources, we're happy to help find those for you. So we'll pop on to our third question. Um, so this is something that we've discussed as a group a bit. And um, like I said, coming from Calgary and being part of a city that has a citywide composting collection program, um, we'd love to discuss with everybody here. Like, do you think a citywide compost collection program is something that the city of Prince George should consider? Um, would you use it? Do you think others would use it? And um, if you're not in Prince George as well, because I know a couple of you aren't, um, what's it like where you live um, in terms of composting as well? And then for Margaret there being in an apartment um, might not apply to you. They don't have access to the usual curbside collection, um, but perhaps if there was a citywide one, um, your apartment might actually get on board, just put in like a, I don't know, a compost chute or something in the building instead of a laundry chute, it's like a compost chute. Um, mm -hmm. And Terry's just noted in the chat that the, this does fall under the regional district of Fraser Fort George rather than um, the city of Prince George. So it'll all depend on them whether a facility gets built um, and that. So it is, it's sort of a higher level issue. But I think the question still applies, like the region, do we want the region to have this? Yeah, man. Yeah, I've heard the same thing, Terry. Everyone's like, "Yes, it should happen," but how do we make it happen? <laughs> Any other thoughts from folks? And just a comment coming in here from Terry as well. Um, it is frustrating that we don't have it. The windrow composting at the landfill can handle it. Um, Jasper and Juno do compost household kitchen waste via windrow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's frustrating. It's very frustrating to know that there are facilities here that could handle it. Um, and there's the capacity there to make it happen. It's just, they're not doing it. <laughs> So I guess maybe a question then for you, Terry, is like, we know we hear it all the time that you think it would be great, but what do you think might actually be able to convince them like to do it? Well, I haven't in 20 years, so I'm not sure what would convince them to do it. Uh, dollars um, is a big one, because um, it is quite, if they don't want to do it, via windrow, then they're gonna to have to do an in-vessel composting. So you're looking at uh, about $10 million to set up that type of system. Um, with windrowing, I've sent them the information from Jasper and Juno um, that they're composting via windrow quite successfully, kitchen waste um, with grizzly bears. Um, and we only have black bears up there. Um, I, I don't know. It's been in the it's been in the plan for like 20 years that I know of. So eventually there might be a bigger cry for it. Um, and just in the last five years, they're actually selling more of the compost they produce. That was another big hindrance. There was not a lot of people, residents, um, landscapers, 
um, purchasing the compost that they were generating. So they had a stockpile of it. And so if they started adding residential kitchen waste to it, they would be creating a lot more. So there was a study done to find out uh, why people weren't buying the compost, how can they promote it more to get people to purchase it. So that just went through that process in the last five years. And so now they have a rebranding called Norgro all around their compost um, and pushing it out to the private and the public sector um, and to the IC and I sector. So looking at our landscapers and our institutions to utilize the compost for their grounds. Um, so the more people that buy the compost and the less that they're stockpiling, there might be an incentive, but they've also just partnered with Fortis BC to collect the methane to go into the grid. So I'm not sure. <laughs> so the more kitchen waste that go into the landfill, the more methane produced, so the more money that they can get from Fortis. So it's kind of a catch-22. Yeah, certainly uh, not an easy question to answer right now. Um, and yeah, I find it interesting as well that there wasn't a whole lot of pickup for buying back the compost, um, especially again, coming from Calgary. <laughs> I'm saying that a lot today. Um, but when we started our composting system, like that was a huge piece from citizens was being able to buy back that compost and they saw a lot of success with it they, then. Yeah, and they do sell a lot of the compost, right? So a truckload is just around $30. Um, and because, because of COVID and you can't shovel your own buckets anymore, I'm not sure when they're gonna open that up before individuals could go up with uh, buckets uh, or totes or garbage cans and fill it up if you don't have a truck. Um, that's why we had six dump truck loads brought down to us on Earth Day this year, um, and it's all gone. So the six truck loads that we had here for a month and a bit went pretty quick. Awesome. So again, even more frustrating knowing that it can be successful um, and that, it, that there would be buy-in from folks um, to have yeah. it. Yeah, and now that they're marketing, it more so that's great um that their only competition is from a few of the stakeholders around here landscaping companies like sunco or art naps mm -hmm. um i guess another side to this uh, discussion is do you think there would be uh, maybe success of a private company was doing composting in prince george Thoughts on that? It was tried. <laughs> tried is the word. <laughs> you need a large area to do it right to pick up residential and it's and if you don't already have things in place, there's a huge startup cost. Mm -hmm. Right. And even for reaps collecting Mondays and Thursdays from six different businesses, it's very taxing. Um, and there's mileage associated with it. And once we get it back, we still have to weigh it, feed the composters, wash all the buckets, dry all the buckets, and then do that again. <laughs> so it's, it's labor intensive. Yep, I know <laughs> that story well. I was uh, part of the composting team at UMBC through uh, the Prince George Public Interest Research Group. And yeah, the sheer amount of volunteers that we needed to make that happened just on campus with all the bins and to wash those out <laughs> throughout the week. It's a lot of like, it's a lot of people that are needed to make that happen. So yeah, I can't even imagine what that would take on a citywide scale. Um, yeah, it's a big process to get in place. I think on the smaller scale, um the idea of finding a friend with a yard uh, is a really cool sort of short, maybe short term, maybe not short term, but a really cool way of getting people who don't have access to compost or just creating those spaces where more people can compost at once is a sort of community and compost building exercise. Uh, at my old property, well, we still have horses, it's a bit of a situation, but uh, we always had a lot of manure. And so people from all around our neighborhood will come and say, hey, can we have a bunch of your manure? 
And so it, you know, it became sort of this neat uh, gift economy where you give people manure and then they show up at your house a day later and they're like, oh, hey, here's a bottle of wine or, oh, hey, here's this thing from our garden. Um, and so that's one of the really, I feel like whenever you start playing with uh, decomposition and gardening and those kinds of things, these interesting sort of community practices spring up that are really healthy and good for both earth and people. So find friends with backyards, bring them rhubarb if you have it, bake the bread. <laughs> I just put a question to you, Helga. How do you think we could expand something more community level within Prince George? So maybe encouraging folks, what would that, what would that look like to you? Well, I feel like this is uh, the wrong person to ask this question. Terry probably has a lot of ideas too. So Terry, feel free to jump in on this question before we wrap up. Um, I think we, we require some kind of structure if we're gonna bring folks together into composting, right? And we do require infrastructure as well. But if we could create a group of people who were willing to work together in neighborhoods and be sort of the hub of composting in that neighborhood, then you could create sort of these hotspots of composting um, and neighbors would ideally, you know, come out and volunteer, help you turn the compost, know what they were doing when they put their compost into your yard. But it's a little bit challenging, I think, on a societal level with you know, our ideas of private property and just not always uh, getting along with our neighbors or even knowing our neighbors' names. I know in some suburban areas, uh, my previous home was sort of being converted into suburbia land and the, the feeling of neighborly collaboration was really evaporating uh, just when you drove past people in cars or when you walked past them on the street there the old culture wasn't there anymore of saying hi and you know exchanging a few words about the weather or whatever and I think that's something that changes as we move towards more urban landscapes perhaps so I think recreating that feeling of neighborhood community and um yeah being willing to work together in order to create compost is the first thing. It's like you have to want to work with other people and you have to trust other people. And that's often a big barrier for us. But I can, I can imagine my mind like a little map where you have like composting hubs and then you have houses connected to those hubs, right? And everyone comes and puts their compost in there and helps turn it. And then everyone gets some of the humus at the end. And yeah, in an, in an ideal world, I'll say in a beautiful world. <laughs> yeah, I think that'd be super cool to see, um, especially here in Prince George, where we do have some, uh, I guess, pretty clear community lines. Um, it'd be a pretty awesome opportunity there to do it by community and have it be more of the grassroots community driven composting instead of relying on a city and a district that just aren't, aren't going to get to it <laughs> in the near future. Um, yeah, certainly lots to think about. And yeah, comment from Terry there as well. A few apartment complexes, having communal composters. Yeah, having that there at apartments is a really great piece where you already have a bunch of people living in one building under the same roof. Um, might as well just put one in their yard and everybody can use it. And I know so, one of our participants mentioned in the challenges that sometimes producing enough waste is a problem, right? And so when you work together with other people, especially if you're in an apartment that maybe has a lot of single people or people with small families, um, that can really be an advantage. But yeah, as Terry mentions, you have to get the landlord on board. So I think, I think that's where you get one of those REAPS um, pamphlets and you just sort of day after day slip it under the landlord's door <laughs> without being noticed. <laughs> Just keep passing them information saying, hey, we want this. Um, maybe one day you'll get it. Um, 
yeah so lots to think about anybody have any final thoughts you'd like to share about composting or um, just good stories about it any final thoughts there four questions that have percolated up until now be careful if you have young children or cousins and stuff because they like playing with the worms and stuff like that and and bugs and I'm not a fan of the bugs and stuff oh but playing for the worms and bugs is good for them just don't let them eat them <laughs> Hakuna Matata it's okay yeah. well <laughs> indeed I had a young child once eat a worm in front of me and they survived but yeah <laughs> chocolate dipped bugs yes no I think one of the joys of seeing kids with compost I know as a kid um we used to always get these really big black beetles once it just they would be in there and then because our composts were quite warm we also used to get big toads because they love how warm it is in the winter and so as a kid finding the first toad in the compost when you dig into it in the spring is like whoa and it's just a really cool way I think to connect kids to that decomposition process and the way that all things sort of degrade and go back to the land and have a new appreciation for some of the creepy crawlies that we often ostracize a bit in our society but that's the soil scientist in me telling you to love your creepy crawlies <laughs> Um, any other thoughts, questions, stories before we wrap up? <laughs> Great comment from Margaret. I especially love the creepy crawlies that eat mosquitoes. <laughs> yeah, I'll appreciate those any day. And then, then with that, um, we'll wrap up here for today. Um, so for today, I know many of you have been at our previous workshops and are likely familiar with this. So for every workshop that we've been doing, we do have a prize for the workshop and today's prize is an outdoor composter from a district of Fraser Fort George and a wing digger. Uh, to go alongside it to make sure you're stirring it up nicely. Um, so for the, we'll do that prize in a second, but also just so you know, if you don't win today, don't worry. All of the attendees um, are also being entered into a final draw, which we, will, which we will be doing at the very end of our workshop series at the end of June. So, uh, so it's three, we have three more workshops and then we'll be doing that draw. Um, and that's also got another compost there, so there's not a, another opportunity there. Um, and for this, you do have to be in Prince George to win the composter, just so you know, uh, that was a little bit harder for us to ship. Um, so yeah, we'll do the draw here. We'll see who wins and we'll see. That is Jen. Jen, are you still here? Okay, actually, Jen isn't still here. So because it was actually so close, I think we can call that as Margaret. Is everybody, is that fair for everybody? <laughs> Are people okay with that? Congrats, Margaret. So, well, then, yeah, we will say congratulations to you today, Margaret. Um, we'll send you an email about that. And yeah, we'll get you somewhere to set that up because that'll be awesome for you. Great. Exactly. You got to yep. make a deal. You give them the composter, they get a composter, and they also get your scraps. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, that wraps up for us today. We'd love for you to stay in touch uh, on our social media or send us an email if you ever have any questions or want to get in contact about composting or any of the other workshops that we've been doing. 
Um, we'd also love to see your pictures of your compost up on social media. So make sure to tag us if you're posting those or um, like from our previous workshops, your gardens, your um, recyclables, anything like that, that you're reducing your kitchen waste with. And again, thank you so much to Terry for joining us today. I know I definitely learned a lot from your presentation and there's lots of info that I'm taking away. So I'm sure lots of others are as well. Um, yeah, we'll conclude for today. Um, we'll be sending out a follow-up email as well with the resources such as the links to REAPS and all their resources as well as our other workshops. So make sure to register for those. We do have a sustainable hunting workshop next week. So if you are interested in um, hunting and learning about sustainable practices, specifically from an Indigenous perspective. Um, we'd love to have you join us for that and invite your friends as well to join. Yeah, thank you everybody for joining today um, and we'll hopefully see you soon.